The clock ray, Ross. Use the clock ray. Section 200! Board! Right, three o'clock. Machine gun in trench. There. Where did that come from? Okay, okay, I see him, I see him. As alluded to in the introductory video of this series, musketry training had evolved since that of 1914. Basic skills like shooting the rifle had changed hardly at all, but rather the infantryman's job had become much more complex with a large number of weapons to become proficient at. That said, the foundation for the effective use of nearly every weapon lay in the training the soldier received on the rifle. In this video, we'll explore some of the preliminary training that would take a recruit from never handling, let alone shooting a rifle, to being ready to shoot on the range. This video won't focus on a specific year, but rather the general preliminary training undertaken throughout the war. The references for this video are taken from the series of manuals known as small arms training. In particular, number one, weapons training, Number two, application of fire. And number three, the rifle. As the video will be a general examination of preliminary training, we'll draw from all relevant PAMs as there were minor changes in details throughout the war. A syllabus for training was detailed in volume one, weapons training. As you can see, it walked the recruit with logical progression through the skills necessary, interjecting practical range work at suitable points. Of note is how information found in different manuals was incorporated at appropriate moments to complete the skills necessary to advance to the next stage. After the recruit passed out of the depot and was pushed to his unit, training continued. Although mostly review, some new subjects, such as the anti-tank rifle, were covered at this time. Periodic training would also continue as a trained man to keep skills fresh. Now, it is not the purpose of this series to detail class by class or lecture by lecture the rifle training as found in 1939, but rather give a synopsis of it, illustrating the high points. The first stage of training included some theory and some basic skills. Perhaps the most fundamental aspect of this was the trajectory model, familiar to even modern day soldiers. Here, the universal relationship between the bore axis, line of sight, and bullet trajectory were explained. This was expanded upon with an examination of terminal performance, the dangerous space. First graze and beaten zone were all covered, as well as the effect of ground on these aspects. These were also applied to machine gun fire. The parts, the mechanism, with stripping and assembling. As you might imagine, naming the parts had to be done before any further training could be attempted given everyone a common set of terminology. The mechanism could be explained, perhaps by the use of a cutaway model. Here, a rifle was relieved of any metal or wood that concealed important parts, so that their form and function could be examined. Stripping of the rifle was the precursor to care and cleaning. Now, admittedly, stripping the rifle was exceptionally simple and easy, a strength, perhaps, of most bolt-action weapons. The bolt, magazine, and sling were all removed, and this facilitated cleaning. Before we delve into these procedures, perhaps an explanation of the kit used to clean the rifle. Oil kept in a bottle, the pull-through, wire gauze, and flannelette. The pull-through and oil bottle were stored in the butt of the rifle, which had a cylinder bored out for that purpose. These basic cleaning tools were supplemented with two others, the chamber stick and the offset funnel. 
The most comprehensive type of cleaning was cleaning after firing, and we'll start with this. The offset funnel was used to deliver water, preferably boiling, through the bore. You see, Mark VII ammunition of the era used cordite as a propellant, which itself wasn't necessarily harmful to the bore. But the primers used in this ammunition resulted in salts being deposited therein. These, when combined with moisture from the atmosphere, would result in corrosion developing. By flushing the bore out with very hot water, these salts were dissolved and washed away. The funnel had an offset spout to deliver water more directly into the bore. The water also had the function of loosening the fouling. The next step was to clean the chamber. A 4x2 was placed in the slot at the narrow end, twisted around and inserted into the chamber, which was cleaned using a twisting motion. 4x2s were made of flannelette, which came in a large 4-inch wide roll. This was marked every 2 inches with red lines. Cut at these lines, it rendered a 4x2, or 4 inches by 2 inches. The next step was to pull through the bore. The pull through was a piece of string with three loops spliced into one end and a weight at the other. By this, materials were drawn through the bore to clean it. Flannelette was placed in the center of three loops at the end of the pull through. Then the hole, starting with the weight, was fed from the breech down the bore, drawing the string behind. Once the weight was clear of the muzzle, the rifle was upended and the pull through was, um, pulled through the bore, maintaining alignment with the bore axis. This step was repeated until the 4x2 came out relatively clean. For use in wartime, when other methods were not expedient or available, wire gauze could be wrapped around the forward loop in the pull through and drawn through the barrel to, in effect, scour out exceedingly heavy fouling. Its use was heavily controlled, understandable as it was quite stiff and abrasive, and prolonged use would damage the bore. Once the wire gauze had been pulled through, flannelette could be used for its aforementioned purpose. Once the barrel was cleaned, an oily 4x2 was pulled through the barrel, preserving it until its next use. The remainder of the rifle, including the bolt and the magazine, were white cleaned with a rag or a flannelette and left lightly oiled. Cleaning before firing was a much simpler affair. Here, as standard procedure, the bore, the chamber, and the face of the bolt were all dried and left free of oil. If required, the bolt was oiled so that it would operate most freely. Daily cleaning saw routine maintenance on a relatively clean rifle. A simple inspection, a pull through, and a wipe down were generally all that was required. This of course could become a little bit more comprehensive due to inclement weather or training conditions. The assembly of the rifle was as simple as its stripping. The bolt was replaced. The magazine replaced and the sling fitted to its sling swivel. Basic fire positions were taught at various stages in training. The primary position was the prone, known as the lying position. This was the default position for most range work as it afforded maximum stability as well as a low silhouette. In addition, the kneeling position was taught for use behind low cover. Here, in particular, was taught the use of the knee and elbow to effectively stabilize the rifle. The sitting position was used to engage targets from a forward slope and featured the use of both elbows rested on the knees. The standing position was perhaps the least stable, but was quick to adopt and was used for close engagements or over high cover. As mentioned, these positions were not just taught out of novelty, but rather for use from behind varying cover, 
shooting from a trench was taught and practiced. It was very stable and vital for defensive work. The same principles could be adopted to the kneeling position. And the prone or lying position could be used for shooting around or over low cover. The position of readiness was an important aspect applicable to the battlefield but also to the range. In it, the fire maintained himself and his weapon in nearly complete concealment, only allowing for observation of the target area. It had variations for the lying, the kneeling, and the standing positions. The skill of aiming was of obvious, crucial importance. Two types of sights were used at various times throughout the war. The number one used an open notch and blade arrangement, while the number four used a rear aperture. These skills also translated directly to all other weapons that featured sights. Aiming off for wind and target movement were also taught. Sight setting was an important skill. The back sight of the number one was of the tangent style with increments to the nearest 25 yards. 100 yard adjustments, however, were the norm. The number one back sight, found on the number four rifle, was adjusted by turning the knob so as to bring the slide up to the appropriate range. The very common number two back sight for the number four was a flip type and was only adjustable from three to 600 yards by flipping it to the appropriate setting. Trigger pressing completed the drills associated with actually firing the rifle. Recruits were taught about the two-stage trigger found on both the number one and the number four rifle, with the distinct first and second pressures. Throughout training, various training aids were used to demonstrate and confirm skills. One of these was the aiming rest. This implement had been used from before the Great War, and indeed versions of it can be traced back to the 1850s. A simple tripod affair, topped with an adjustable bracket that held the rifle, it allowed the sights to be aligned on a target, both for demonstration as well as evaluation purposes. The rifle was pushed into the spring steel clips, and then through the use of the traversing clamp and the elevating screw, the student brought the sights to bear. This technique could also be used by instructors to demonstrate correct sight alignment for the recruits. Aim correctors were also used, covered in a similar video in the musketry of 1914 series. It used a piece of smoked glass to achieve a prismatic effect, thereby allowing an instructor to see exactly how a recruit was aligning his sights. There was a version for the number one rifle, which clamped onto the handguard behind the back sight. There was also a version that could be used with the number one sight on a number four rifle. Although the predominant use of the number two, three, or four back sights and the apparent dates stamped on examples of these might push their date to the post-war period. The eye disc was another way to check for correct sight alignment. A small disc with an aiming mark was mounted on a stick or rod at the center of the aiming mark or at the appropriate aiming point. A small hole was drilled. By lying in front of the student and having him aim at the hole, the instructor could look down the sights front to back and into the eye of the student, thus checking the sight picture. Integral to the practice of musketry drills was the use of dummy or drill rounds. By the time of the Second World War, they were typically Mark VI. My examples are a mix of Mark VI and what appeared to be the earlier Mark V. In order to bring the weapon into and out of action, drills for loading and unloading were taught. On the command load, first the load position was adopted. This saw the left foot checked forward and the rifle brought to a 45 degree position in front of the body. First, the safety catch was pushed forward and then the bolt opened. A charger of five rounds was then drawn from the pouch or bandolier and placed in the charger bridge. Up until 1942, the prescription was for loading five rounds only at one time. This must be seen as a training point and most assuredly, the magazine would have been charged with 10 rounds on any kind of active service. 
1942, this was enshrined in the manual, and loading 10 rounds became the drill for training as well. The drill could also be performed from the kneeling position, with the rifle butt braced on the right thigh. In the prone position, the rifle was simply held at the point of balance while pushing the rounds into the magazine. On the command unload, the safety catch was pushed forward and the bolt worked rapidly back and forth, ejecting the remaining rounds to the ground. Satisfied the weapon was empty, the bolt was closed, springs eased, and the safety catch applied. There was also an alternate method for muddy or inclement conditions, whereby the magazine was removed and the chamber cleared. Springs were eased, and then the magazine was emptied by hand, replaced on the rifle when complete. Shooting had to be placed in context and controlled for it to be effective on the battlefield. For this, a series of drills, techniques, and commands were used. This was known as fire discipline. The salient areas that made up fire discipline were judging distance, target indication, and fire control orders. One of the most important and underrated skills, judging distance was integral to site setting and thus effective fire. Two methods were taught, the unit of measure and the appearance method. The former used a known distance and by multiplying that distance out to the target, the range could be estimated. Here, with the target on a small rise, a known distance in this case, that to the tree in the foreground is noted, 100 yards. Then, by estimating how many of those units fit between you and the target, the range can be estimated. In this case, four, yielding a range of 400 yards. The appearance method relied on characteristics of certain shapes, namely the human body at various ranges. Of usefulness in this method, the blade of the front sight of the number one rifle, for instance, as shown here, could be used to judge the distance based on the height of the target. Once the distance was known to the target, its position had to be communicated to the rest of the group. For this, a target indication was given. Targets were categorized into two groups, easy and difficult. The indication of easy targets used the range and a simple breakdown of the ground to the front in relation to the direction faced. In this example, an obvious target appears. The ground is broken into quarters left and right. In this case, one quarter left is the most appropriate, and the indication is given. 100, one quarter left, truck. For difficult to see targets, three methods were used. The reference point, the clock ray, and the finger. The reference point method built on the easy target indication by including the use of prominent features near the target. By directing the eye using the quarters as used in the easy indication from the reference point, the target was identified. 200, bend in road, slightly right, sniper. The finger method used a correction of a number of fingers held up at arm's length, placed either left or right of a reference point. Here, the reference point of a stump is used. This may have already been designated and given a name. 300, stump, two fingers right, machine gun. The fingers and knuckles of the hand could also be translated into degrees for adjusting machine gun, mortar, or even artillery fire. The clock ray method used a reference point but then superimposed a two-dimensional vertical clock face on top of the reference point with its center superimposed. Here the reference point is end of road. The clock face is superimposed and a line is drawn from the center to the target. The so-called time is noted. The clock ray was combined with a direction so that there would be no confusion. 600, 
end of road. Up, one o'clock, sniper in woodline. Once the target had been indicated, fire control could then be directed. Four types of fire control orders were prescribed, normal, brief, anticipatory, and snap shooting. A normal fire control order was made up of five, later four pieces of information. The first was the unit the order was directed at, section, platoon, or so on. The range, given first, to give a distance at which to search for the target, as well as the range used to set the sights, then the indication, as explained previously, using whichever method was appropriate. In the 1939 version of the fire control order, which was standard until 1942, there was a stipulation of a number of bursts to be fired by the Bren gun, or rounds by the rifleman. This was later dropped after 1942. Lastly, it was the command to fire. The commands used were fire, indicating a slow rate of five rounds a minute, or bursts, or rapid fire, indicating a rate of 15 rounds per minute, or as trained to 10 rounds in 40 seconds. There were three other types of fire control orders, namely the brief, the anticipatory, and the snap shooting. Somewhat self-explanatory, a brief fire control order gave the very minimum of information for what would probably be a most obvious target. Here, 300 half-right rapid fire is an example given. For anticipatory orders, the fire control order was suffixed by await my order. This let the fire unit know where the target was, but not to engage until sometime in the future on orders of the commander. For snap shooting, the command to fire was fire when you see a target. Here, although no enemy was visible, the men were directed to observe a certain area, then engage when the enemy presented himself. As mentioned earlier, in 1942, when the manuals were rewritten, the fire control order lost the designation of numbers of rounds or bursts, leaving four categories of information. The targetry used during the Second World War was in some ways very similar to that used during the Great War, although differing in detail. During the Great War, targetry had overwhelmingly relied on the use of a series of figure targets, numbered one to six, representing the shapes of soldiers in various positions. These were used as standalone targets, as well as being incorporated into more complex versions with scoring rings. By the 1920s, this had changed somewhat, and a new suite of targets would be used right through to the midpoint of the war. What later might be described as tin hat targets were used. These featured a bullseye with only the top half colored black, thereby making the acquisition of the sight picture all the easier. The four-foot version used a 12-inch bull with the top half colored black and a series of rings in six-inch intervals, 12 inches being the bullseye, following on 24, 36, and 48-inch rings. This was known as the small classification target. The large version was a six-foot target for longer ranges. This used a two-foot bull of similar makeup and rings of 36, 48, and 72 inches. The top half of both targets was gray and the lower ochre. For grouping work, the small target was fitted with a four inch white paper patch as shown here. For snap shooting, a 22 inch circle known as the large snap shooting target with the top half painted black and the lower ochre was used. Now, the same suite of figure targets were still used but these were reserved for field firing and what was termed battle shooting. More on this later. The figure six, that of a moving man, changed from the Great War style in a crouched position to a more upright version, shown here. There was one addition to the suite of targets in the 1930s. This came in the form of the figure 4A, a modification of the older number four, updated with a more contemporary silhouette of a prone man wearing a helmet. An important part of range work, for field firing, these targets could be rigged to appear and disappear. This suite of targets was used until 1942, when figure targets were once again used for classification range work, as shown here. They were to be of one color, 
although the older, bicolor style were accepted until stocks ran out. For anti-aircraft and anti-tank work, there were appropriate silhouette targets. In order to evaluate individuals on their competency in preliminary training, a series of tests were prescribed. These were known as Tests of Elementary Training, or TOETs. For the first half of the war, there were nine such tests. The first was a series of questions on the care of the rifle and ammunition, as well as perhaps some simple skills that may have been incorporated. The second was adjustment of sights. A series of ranges were given, with timely application to the backsight, the aim of the exercise. The third was an evaluation of where to aim. Two targets were used, the small classification and the figure three. Two aims per target were expected, and they were conducted using an aiming rest. The fourth test was a demonstration of correct trigger pressing. This was checked using an eye disc. Following on, the fifth test was for judging the ability to aim off. Given certain circumstances of either wind or movement, as part of the preamble, the man would have to demonstrate the correct aim in these circumstances using the aiming rest. Number six was in snap shooting. Using an eye disc, four four-second exposures were given, with the man having to raise the rifle from the position of readiness, aim, and fire. Test seven was in rapid fire. Here, the man fired five rounds rapid, followed by loading another five rounds in the magazine, buttoning the pouch, and firing five more. At the conclusion of the drill, he was to load a further five rounds, button the pouch, and apply the safety catch. Test eight was a demonstration of the various fire positions incorporating the use of cover. The standing, the kneeling, the sitting, the lying. Test nine dealt with the recognition of targets. Although here the use of a landscape target may have been used, a man had to aim at the indicated target using an aiming rest. 400, one quarter right, bend in road. Five hundred, one quarter left, red roof, down six o'clock, left hand window. In 1942, these tests were reduced to four. Aiming. Aiming off. Rapid fire. And an evaluation of the usual assortment of fire positions. So this brings us to the end of preliminary musketry training during the Second World War. Now that we've introduced the subject and here examined the training taken away from the range, we can now further explore the range work of the Second World War. Of course, we've already done some of it in the form of the close quarter shooting series already on the channel, but other conventional range work has yet to be tried. In no particular order, practices on the miniature range the 30 yards range, as well as the pre-war 1939 rifle course and both the wartime rifle courses, the 1939 and the 1942. Stay tuned, there's lots of shooting coming up. Many thanks to James and Mike at the Museum of the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada for the kind use of the aiming rest and the cutaway SMLE. Their participation in the project was greatly appreciated. Thanks boys. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.